Hey friends, welcome to the All Means All podcast. I'm here in my Boise State clothes. If you're watching, if not, you I've just confessed I should maybe call it my prayer cloth this season as we walk through this interesting time of football. You know, there are different seasons, aren't there? This looks like fall. It feels like fall. You can see the pumpkins behind me. The leaves are falling down. If you looked up in the foothills, you might even see a little snow on the foothills. The seasons change. And so the question we have as we walk through the season is, where are you in the seasons of giving? You know, there's sometimes where we can barely give. If we're honest, we're caring for a parent. Uh, maybe we're helping a kid get through college. Maybe we're paying off debt. But you're still a giver. Are you growing in your giving? We're going to look at generosity today and maybe even think about what's it mean to be a, become a generous giver? Let's worship together. <music> Good morning, church. My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to Cathedral of the Rockies. If you've been searching for a church home and you found yourself here, whether here online or here in person, I hope your search for a church is over. We would be honored to be your church. I'd be honored to be your pastor. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear how God's meeting you in your life, where you've journeyed together, where you've struggled Love to hear your questions and uh, help you connect. So feel free to reach out, pastor at boisefumc.org. I always love to say that on the phone. What's your email? Pastor at boisefumc.org. So <clears throat> now you've got it and you're ready for the day. What? You'll never forget it from then on out. Well, you? you got it, yeah. Yeah. Um, last, a year ago summer, I had the privilege to take a sabbatical and to walk the Camino de Santiago in northern Spain. I started up in France in uh, saint jean pied de port and then for just over a month walked every day. The Camino is a, is a pilgrimage. And there are all kinds of pilgrimages in the world. There's pilgrimages in our country, but there's historic pilgrimages. This is a pilgrimage that has existed for over a thousand years. For a thousand years, people have made their way to the place of Saint, from St. jean pied de port or somewhere else in Europe to Santiago to be in the place of St. James. Some days walking is it's, it's an easy path, and some days it's a tough path, but you come to discover, most of all, it's a generous path. It's a way of love. Folks are all there headed in the same direction. And so you, you make your way. It's a pretty simple life. Walk, eat, sleep, repeat. Walk, eat, sleep, repeat. You just keep, I mean, every day's about the same. And I was about two weeks in when um, one of my friends, and this, one of the things you learn on the Camino is people come and people go. Some people walk faster than you, so they leave you in the past. Some people walk slower than you, you leave them in the past. Some people come for three days and walk for three days. Some come for a week. Some, when you start, have already been walking a month. Maybe they started further back. So people come and go on the Camino. And everybody does the Camino their own way. Well, one of those days I had said goodbye to a friend who I met the day I started we stayed in the same hostel. We kept meeting up. Our, our pace was about the same, and so we kept connecting. And then they finished their journey, and they were leaving. So I was saying goodbye. So it was kind of a sad day. I was sad to say goodbye to a new friend. And I had more miles to go. And as I walked, it's, I was doing about 17 miles that day. And as I walked, I, I, I thought, occasionally you have options to take different paths. I thought, I'm going to take one of the side paths today and get to the town I'm going to and I took the side path and uh, a guy on a bike kind of comes right in front of me and waves me down and stops me and he says where are you going and so I pull out my little book and with my best terrible uh, Spanish I say Burkeanos del Real Camino and he says what <laughs> so I show him in the book and he goes oh yeah yeah back <laughs> and I had missed a turn and he spoke to me mainly in Spanish and tried to tell me if you go this way no no 
back. So I'm like, oh, really, I'm already tired. It's already, so I make the way, finally get to the little village of Burkiano. So I get there and I'm looking for my albergue, this, this building that's on the screen. I'm looking for this building and, and it's not on the main path. It's like four blocks off. And most of the time they're right on the way and I just can't find it. I mean, it's a little village and I just, I'm wandering around and I'm like, I just, I just want a bed. <laughs> and then finally I see it. And this place was um, a devotional albergue, which means that uh, some are run by cities, they're municipal, some are private, and some are faith-driven. This one was a faith-driven. People are there serving, and I walk in, and I say the normal, may I have a bed? And he says, sign your name. I sign my name. And Peter looks down, reads my name, and goes, Dwayne, we've been waiting for you. You know, simple words generous words and I knew he had just read my name so he didn't know me but to say we've been waiting for you was exactly what I needed to hear then he kind of looked me up and down and went you need a nap and you got time go take a nap you, you might need a beer too he said that's two blocks over there and he showed me where that was he said, but get a nap first. Maybe get a beer if you need. Check the internet if you need. And he said, but be here at 630 because we need you to help cook dinner. <laughs> and then he said, over there is kind of our generosity corner. That's where you, people have been traveling by now a couple weeks. And after a couple weeks and you're carrying your backpack, you, you start to realize there's some things you, you don't want anymore. <laughs> Like, I don't really need a second pair of shoes or I don't really need that shirt. And so you leave, they said, leave anything that you don't want to carry. And if there's something there that you need, take it. And so again, I was amazed by this, just this brief moment of generosity. We've been waiting on you. Take what you need, leave what you can. What does generosity look like? Who, who's taught you to be a generous person? One of the ways to think about generosity, and we'll, we'll talk about it at the end of the message today, is where are you on the generosity ladder? What step, what rung are you on on the generosity ladder? Generosity is a learned behavior for most of us. We're gonna be in Mark today. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the same story. We'll put it up on the screen. Mark 10, verse 17 might be familiar to you. Let's read these verses out loud together. Read with me. As Jesus started on his way, a person ran up to him, fell on their knees before him. Good teacher, they asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now that seems like a great question, doesn't it? Especially in church, I mean... <laughs> What must I do to get eternal life? I mean, it's kind of the church question. What must I do to get eternal life? I love the questions that people ask Jesus, and I hope in your faith journey, you know questions are a normal part of faith development. You should always have questions about God. You should always have questions about how your faith works. And Jesus isn't freaked out by the question. He actually is more freaked out by the title. When he said, good teacher, he says, why do you call me good? <laughs> Nobody's good except God. And then the conversation continues between the two of them. He repeats back to him, what must I do to get eternal life? Well, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not kill, uh, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Interesting, Jesus doesn't name all the commandments, but he names a lot. And the young man's response to Jesus is, this is great news, because I have kept all those commandments. Since I was a kid, I have lived like that. And the scripture says in Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at them and loved them. He looked at them and loved them. And he responds, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Wow. This is one of the scriptures where we go, I, I hope this isn't a prescription like for everybody. 
I mean, it would be a great day tomorrow as this transfer of wealth took place, but Tuesday would be kind of rotten, right? Because we'd be in line somewhere to say, who's going to take care of me? So we read this text and we go, this clearly can't be a prescription for us. Why is it a prescription for him? Have you ever overrated your goodness and underrated your sinfulness? Have you ever overrated your generosity and underrated your selfishness? Most of us don't think we're selfish at all. A person called the church a few years ago and they had a complaint. I call that Tuesday. Um, They... (laughs) They called and they said, Pastor, I'm, I'm just really disappointed in you. And I said, okay. And they said, I gave a generous gift to the church. I never heard from you. My first response was, oh, well, thank you for your generosity. That's amazing that you gave a generous gift to the church. Fantastic. You know, every now and then we are bombarded. There are seasons where the mail is overwhelming. And every now and then we do miss maybe a gift. And I'm sorry, we didn't get a note to you. I'll take care of it. I go to the folks in the accounting office and say, hey, this person, here's their name. They gave a generous gift. They gave me the time frame. And we looked and we looked and we looked. And we're like, it's not there. And then finally, the accountant comes and goes, oh, it's there. It just has a lot less zeros than you think of when you think of the word generosity. (laughs) This was a person of great means. And their generous gift was what many of us would put in the plate weekly. (laughs) But in their mind, it was generous. Wow. It's easy to overrate our generosity and underrate our selfishness. So the, this, this dialogue takes place. Uh, go, sell, give, come, follow me. Jesus doesn't tell Nicodemus to sell everything. He doesn't tell the woman at the well to sell everything. But this guy, he gets go sell everything, come and follow me. Why? Well, the story is about the commandments. So think back to the commandments. What's the first commandment? Open book test. First commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. No idols. First commandment. Why would Jesus say, go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor and come and follow me? And the, the answer of the rich young one is, oh, not, I'm not going to do that. Could it be? that wealth has become an idol? Could it be you've perceived that you're, you're following the commandments and the truth is you missed the biggest one, the first one? It's possible to keep the commandments and not live the commandments. How hard, Jesus says, it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we hear that and we say, sucks to be them. And the world laughs because we are the rich of the world. Friends, there's a powerful relationship between our true spiritual condition and our attitudes and actions concerning money and possessions. John Hoggard Lee says, uh, we read the gospels if we have no money and we spend our money if we know nothing of the gospel. Wow. Wow. One of the greatest and hardest gifts in a life of faith is learning to live a life of repentance. Repentance is a church word that means change the way that you think, change the way that you live, change the way that you act. And one of the greatest gifts in life is to repent, to admit, I was wrong about that. If you're in a relationship of any kind, those words, I was wrong, will get you a long way. They will open doors for greater relationship. Amy Jill Levine reminds us, she's a professor of New Testament, Jewish professor of New Testament, and she writes, one cannot obey the Torah on one's own since the Torah, the the laws of Moses, is necessarily relational. To love the neighbor and to love the stranger require actual neighbors 
and strangers. You, in other words, you have to be in community to live the Torah. You have to be in community to live the faith. Mark writes, a rich young ruler walks away sad because he's not gonna do that. How many of us are like the rich young ruler? We wanted Jesus to look at us when we say, what must I do to get eternal life? To say, you're good. You've already done it. You don't need to change anything. That's what the rich young ruler is expecting. Not the challenge of, actually, you've missed the whole point. Change your entire life. Go, sell, give, come, and follow me. Wow how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. There's that one verse I love so much in this text, especially in Mark, when it says, Jesus looked at them and loved them. It's the only place in Mark where Jesus' love of an individual is mentioned. Jesus looked at them and loved them. What's he love about them? He loves that he's asking questions. He loves that he's hungry for the kingdom. He loves that he's willing to live in the tension. He loves it even enough to let him walk away. Now there is a hint. There is a hint at the end of the Gospel of Mark. There's an unnamed disciple that shows up at Jesus' death. Could it finally be him? That's a different sermon. One thing you lack. One thing you lack. What what do you think he lacks? He lacks community. He's not saying go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then live destitute and homeless. No, he says, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and come. (laughs) Join me, be part of this. See our community? Live with us. People are providing for us. We we don't know where we're gonna sleep tomorrow, but someone will provide. We don't know what we're gonna eat tomorrow, but someone will provide. Come join the community. Sometimes it's easier to live a solitary life and not be generous than it is to join the community. Aaron's mom wrote this about him. She said, someday, someday, Aaron, you're gonna do something so amazing that everyone's gonna say, Aaron Collins did that? Aaron was 28 years old when he wrote his last will and testament. His mom says that we don't really know why he wrote it other than he had just bought a motorcycle. He wrote a will and testament. He gave a list of people he wanted to bless should his life end early. He said, I want to give my computer games to my nephew. I want to return the motorcycle to the guy I bought it from because he looked so sad as I drove away. He said, I want to give some money to the homeless, to the poor. And then at the end of his will, he wrote, I want you all as a family, if I die, go out and eat and leave an awesome effing tip. And he said, not a 25% tip. I want you to go get a pizza and leave 500 bucks. It was a couple years later when Aaron's life abruptly ended July 7, 2012. It's always tragic when a young one dies unexpectedly. His parents and family made the difficult decision to not focus on their grief but to use their grief as a unique way to celebrate his life as they found his will and decided that they would leave a generous tip so they as a family gathered and they went to a restaurant and got a pizza watch the screen five years ago and he asked us to go out and leave someone an awesome tip 
And so we've been doing that for five years. And today we're here to give you an awesome tip. Oh my gosh. So. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I feel like I just hit the water. <laughs> well, I think that's true. This, I appreciate it. You're welcome. This is $500. Oh. Oh, oh my god, you're serious? Serious? Yeah, it's $500. Yeah, That's from, from here. Hang on. The family's been continuing their generosity. Over the last five years, they have traveled to over 106 places and given a generous tip. Because when they did the first one, they just took a little video, posted it on YouTube, and then other people started sending money to celebrate Aaron's life. And people from all over the world sent over $50,000 to give a generous tip to the waiter at the pizza place. What does generosity look like? What does your generous life look like? look like so we're in that time where at least once a year um, part of my job is to challenge you to look at your generosity because everything we do has a cost related to it and so giving in the church is part of church and I always give you a couple caveats when we talk about giving giving makes people nervous I get that money makes people nervous I get that the scripture is really clear never give out of manipulation so I always give you the freedom if you're feeling really antsy, then just know this is for your neighbor then. <laughs> and you can elbow them and go, he's talking to you. Because <laughs> I'm cool, right? So think of generosity like this. This is a generosity ladder. We use ladders to get to things we can't get to if we don't have it. So in other words, if I can't reach a light bulb, I get the ladder. If I can't paint the top of the ceiling, I get a ladder. And so a ladder is just a tool that allows us to do things that if we don't have it, we can't do. And the first step on the ladder is not a big deal. It's not really very high. You still can get hurt. There's still some risk. And that's true in giving. You have to calculate what you're doing. The first step's the beginning step. It's, it's where we start. And again, not too scary up here. The beginning step in the life of a church is to say, I want to be part of the community, and so I'm going to set my giving regularly and give regularly. Well, that means you write a check each week. Some of you remember what checks are. <laughs> or that means you go to the website and say, I'm going to do online giving, and I'm going to give regularly. Kathy and I give regularly every Friday. That's the day we've chosen in our life to give. I give every Friday because I grew up in church, and I'm used to when the plate came around, you put something in the plate. And so it feels a little weird when the plate comes around and I don't have anything to put in. So one of the ways I get that, that kudos back is, you know, I, I give on Friday, late Friday afternoon, I get an email from the church saying we received your gift. So it's kind of like putting it in the plate. Here in this service, we tend to do the baskets up front. We encourage you as you come for communion to put it in the basket. But about 55% of you have set your giving electronically, either through your own church, your own bill pay or through the church encourage you to do that why it gives us consistency as an organization otherwise churches you need you may not know this churches that don't do online giving get about 70 percent of their money in three months and then they have to live off the rest of it the, the rest of the year when we do this it levels out the year for us and allows us to have health through the year and it's helpful to the church and it's helpful to you because again we tend to overrate our generosity and underrate our stinginess. We tend to think we're giving more than we actually are. If you, if you give just when you're here, and you say, I give $100 every time I'm here, well, are you here every week? I can tell you the answer, no. <laughs> Few of you are. Most of us get here when we can. That's part of the rhythm of life. But if you give consistently, so figure it out. You might give once a month, you might give once a year, you might give... You might give every week like me, but I encourage you to set it, automate the things in your life that are important. Automate it. Now the next step is a little more scary because it's up one more. So you've moved up the generosity ladder, right? First step's beginning, this is growth. 
what's growth? Well, I've been here a season, I've been given regularly, and, and now I'm gonna look at what I give. The average American gives under 3% of their income through a faith institution. So, are you average? You know where you are. And then you might say, that the simple prayer always says, God, what do you wanna do through me? How do I take a step toward generosity? Generosity is about giving to God. It's about saying, God, you're important in my life, and so I wanna make this consistent. So maybe if you're at 3%, you go, we'll go up. Maybe you had a 3% raise, cost of living, go up. 3% of what you gave, increase. Or maybe if you were working toward tithing, we'll talk about that next week. Maybe you say, I wanna move one step up. I give three, I'm going to four this year. Next year to five. I'm gonna learn to live differently. Now the last step's a little scary because you start to get up here. You're not quite up here where it says, do not stand. But you are up here and you're a little bit higher off the ground and this is the generosity step. This is when you take a bigger look at your whole life and say, are we capable of generosity? Maybe even when we're gone. Like do we put the church in our will? Do we make a one-time gift to the legacy funds of the church that are perpetual funds that keep growing and giving? Is there a way for us to be generous? So I encourage you. Next week, you'll get a letter from me with an envelope in it. The envelope says, estimate of giving. This is not um, a contract. We won't come after you. Well, maybe we should. Uh, We won't come come after you. This is your promise to God. Well, then why do I turn it in? Because you're making a commitment, and it helps us see where people are growing in the life of faith. So I encourage you to read the letter, to pray the prayers that are in the letter, and then respond. Bring that envelope back or mail it in in the next couple weeks. Let's pray. God, thank you that you give us stories of generosity and you teach us. You teach us that it's not always easy and that sometimes we confess we're like that rich young ruler and we just walk away when the opportunity for generosity appears. It feels like too much. But may we not miss the call to live in community, to come and follow you, to join you where you're working. God, meet us here. Help us to become a generous church. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. As we finish our time, Seasons of Giving, just remind you to think about that prayer. Hey, God, what do you want to do through me? How do you want to make a different world through me? I remind people all the time, there is no oil well under, uh, by the church, no gold under the church. We exist on the giving of others. So if you're part of the church, will you make your giving a priority as we continue our worship together, as we continue our, our serving together, as we continue our life together? Because together, we can make a different world. Thanks for being here.